I was trying to think about an illustration to set out the subject that I would like to deal with this afternoon. And what came to mind was certain nuts that we eat. I think about holiday season and when you can buy them in their hull, shell, pecans, walnuts, so forth. Well, have you ever noticed that when you buy them that way, that you can't tell the worth of the thing by just looking at the shell. And therefore, you'll have, hopefully most of them will be good, but you'll break some of them open and they won't be worth anything, certainly not to eat. Maybe they're going to compost heap, but that's about it. And today, this afternoon, with Father's Day looming before us, I would like to talk what makes a good father and it makes a good person and it makes also a good mother. It makes a good anybody. And that is the character of your inward man, your real you, your person. Now what do nuts have to do with that? Well, it's not like a fellow told me he actually witnessed this. Still sounds more like a preacher's story to make the point than it does actually happen, but it was told to me as it actually happened. The fellow was preaching a funeral sermon. He was good friends of the person that had passed away. He had known them for years, and he knew the widow and the rest of the family. And he was trying to talk about and illustrate the inward man. And he said it's like a, it's, it's, it's like a nut. We still have the shell, but the nut's gone on. Well, needless to say, that caused, according to the tale I was told, quite a bit of laughter, and especially from the widow <laughs> and all those that really knew it. Well, now, that's probably what you'll remember about this, but that's not the point. <laughs> it's just that that came to mind, too, when I was thinking about using nuts to illustrate my point. You cannot look on the outside alone and see what the most important thing is about a person. There's an old adage that I came across and it says it's not the size of the dog in the fight but the size of the fight in the dog. Now, that may not fit too much in our day and time, but when I grew up, you had dogs running all over the place, and invariably, they would get into a fight. And I couldn't tell you, and hadn't thought about that much until I was thinking about this, of how you don't see that much anymore. Well, I know it happens, but in this part of the world where you got leash laws and all that stuff, you don't quite see it like it was in smaller towns in the South when everybody's dog was going wherever. And if you had a gathering of people, you had a big gathering of dogs. And that was especially true even back before my time when you had horses and mules and all that drawing things and there'd be usually two or three dogs trotting along behind. So we've left that part of our culture behind to a great extent. But you had these things develop back in those days because it was nothing to witness a dog fight. You can no more than act in actuality, judge, discern the worth of a human being, a man, and apply that to the father of what the Bible teaches about a father. And to anyone else, the worth of a person by the appearances alone, any more than you can take an English walnut in the shell and just look at it for a minute and say, that's good. You can't, you can't do it. The true worth of anybody 
is what's on the inside. And that's where there is a corresponding relationship between a human being and the nut. <laughs> so we're not just interested on the outward appearance. We're even told not to judge according to appearance, but to judge righteous judgment. Somebody has said, never judge a man by his clothes. The tailor made one, God made the other. Well, that's emphasizing a point too. Because I think I've seen a lot of folks over the years who were not dressed in as nice a clothes as some people, but it was the best they had. And there's the key to it. And then there were others that were dressed in fine array, but their person was worthless. Now, you know, one of the marks of the notorious crime families is that those fellows dress exorbitantly with very expensive shoes and ties and shirts and coats, but what are they worth on the inside? They're wicked. They're corrupt. Now the important point I want to make for you and for me and not just looking at others but looking at ourselves is that how do we examine ourselves? David said, For the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. Second Chronicles 28, the latter part of verse 9. To the great prophet Jeremiah who did his work as Jerusalem was falling around him and people still were impenitent. He said, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Jeremiah 17, 10. And over in the book of Acts, Acts 15 and verse 8, Peter declared, God knows the heart. You could very well sit here this afternoon or any other gathering convened for such purposes as we're here to worship God. And you might show all outward appearances of doing exactly what God wanted you to do in worshiping Him. And yet, you wouldn't be because your mind is somewhere else. Your interest is somewhere else. And it's going to be that way tomorrow and the next day, wherever you are. It's a sham. It's a pretense. But just looking on the outward appearance, you could not tell. But listen. God, who's omniscient, knowing all that's the object of knowledge, knows us through and through. There's nothing hidden from Him. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in His sight. For all things are naked and open unto the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. Hebrews 4.13 I suggest throughout the day that ought to be on our mind. You cannot hide things from God. He knows. And above all, we must realize that God judges that which is in our hearts. Notice when you obey the gospel, you obey from the heart. The whole heart's involved, the whole inner man, the whole person in obedience to the truth. The intellect the conscience, the will, the feelings, all that's involved in a person obeys from the heart. They're all in tune with the truth of God that they're obeying. So it really, outward appearances are vain. So as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. When Samuel looked upon Eliab, the son of Jesse. Remember, they're looking for a king. Saul has proven he wasn't what he started out to be. 
But God was judging completely differently, I guess you could say. When he told Samuel, look not on his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. 1 Samuel 16, 7. Samuel saw in David's brother a fine specimen of a man. That's all he could see as a mere human being. But God already knew what was in that man. So fine clothes and stylish things and how one carries himself or she does may be very regal in your bearing or courtly manners certainly can blind our eyes. You may not care a thing about this, but I watched uh, the big to-do they have in England every year when all of the people, including the royal family, comes out. They troop the colors at Whitehall. But I remembered it looking at King Charles and his queen consort and looking at some of the others. Can you remember all of the absolute corruption that went on in that family of which none of them know to repent of? Well, they're dressed as fine as you'd want to dress. They know how to, as far as manners are concerned, they're the epitome of that. But Edwin Lee, what are they? Just as corrupt as they can be. Certainly not examples for moral living. Very far from being religious in accordance with the teaching of the New Testament. So we can't just look at people like that and bring it on down to where we are. You can't do it. Now, this has nothing to say again, uh, against uh, dressing up, so to speak. There's a reason people have dressed up. We call it a dress occasion or whatever. I, I think we've lost all of that in our day and time. And I certainly remember where I first preached. Brother Douglas Greening had given that land up on Hickory Knoll above the lake that he had built down there for the church building. He'd been there for years. That's where I preached my first sermon. And he would come walking every morning from his house, which was just about a, I don't know, 400 yards from the Hickory Knoll where the church building was. And he'd come up there and he would be in his starched new overalls and a white shirt a time. He was dressed up. Now, I, I knew, <laughs> because I knew them, he could wear about any finer he wanted. But that was where he grew up and the way they grew up, and men of that time many times grew up that way. And even the preachers of that day and time, having talked with them, many of them, all they had was one black suit. They may have had two. And they wore it all the time. But they were usually the ones who did. And unless you lived in town, you didn't necessarily have a suit. Country people didn't have much. But I do know they had character. And they had training. And they understood if they were truly converted. When they came together, they taught their kids and they taught themselves put their best foot forward. Where'd that idea ever come from? Or dressing up for things. Your Sunday go to meeting clothes. Where'd that ever come from? Why did it? What formed in the mind of a person to talk like that? Because they want to do the best they can. Well, that doesn't speak against what I'm trying to say, what the Bible teaches. It does mean they could have put on their best bib overalls and still been a stinker. I understand that. So there's two different things we're speaking of here. One has to do with what's inward. And I can tell you today, simply from experience and knowing humanity, there are a host of folks that gathered for worship today in their finery, if they still do that in very many places. 
but pretty much inwardly they're worthless. What we're trying to say is the outward appearance doesn't guarantee the inward man is what God wants that person to be. On the other hand, dressing slouchily <laughs> doesn't do that either. And if I were over in some other countries, according to their culture, I might not dress the same way I do here. But that's not our point at this time. Our point is you cannot look on the outward appearance of a person and get all you need to know to determine what the character or religious standing is with God of that person. Son of God also warned then of a superficial evaluation. And you'll remember that he indicted the Pharisees saying, Ye judge after the flesh. John chapter 8 verse 15. We just all tend to let it all rest in the temporal fineries that we have. That tilts the scales for a lot of people. Jesus taught, as I've already quoted, judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment, John 7, 24. Uh, therefore, he did not say it was a sin to judge, but he urged and directed the disciples to judge with a different standard. And that is the truth of God and whether people are living that out in their daily lives. He did not leave them groping for ways and means of determining their judgment. He said, you shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles, Matthew 7, 16. He didn't say you would know them by their bib overalls. He didn't say you would know them by the kind of tie they wear. Especially in that day and time, nobody wore a tie. <laughs> so a lot has to do with that kind of thing. A nurseryman judges a tree by the fruit of the tree. I may have mentioned this before, but I always owned an apricot tree. When we lived in Austin, I went to the nursery and bought an apricot tree. I, they said it was an apricot tree. It was labeled an apricot tree. They sold it to me for an apricot tree. We planted it in the first year. You know, they never really do much. But this one had two or three blooms on it, and it had a little fruit start showing up on it. And when it got big, it was a pear. Couldn't judge it by appearance, could I? They said it was a apricot but it wasn't when it bore fruit the character of it made it clear it was a pear so we must judge righteously by praising the very fruit we bear out in our lives when a person tells me I'm a Christian I follow the New Testament teaching of my Lord well did, did you repent of your sins and were you baptized in Christ no 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 what am I supposed to think well, he is. No. I say, you may think you are, but you're not. A person says, I worship God today, according to the teaching of the Bible. But they didn't observe the Lord's Supper in that assembly. And they may have had some sort of orchestra playing while they sang. Now, did they worship God acceptably? No, they did not. Were they sincere? Could have been just as sincere as they could be. Sincerely wrong. I think sometimes we fail to realize you can be sincerely wrong. So by their fruits you shall know them. We need to learn I can know me by my fruits. I can profess to myself great things, but if they involve discharging obligations, God and his word is laid upon me, am I doing that? Is that my makeup within my character, in my mind? So his instructions, that is Christ's instructions, are that Christians can and must judge. But we must judge according to the revealed mind of God as to what's right and what's wrong, beginning my own life. Now, everybody here that's obeyed the gospel had to conclude that I need to obey the gospel. 
I am in sin. I am lost. If I died now, I would go to hell. I now know the truth. I've got to rise up and do something about this because I want to go to heaven. And we obey the gospel. What can you say then? You can say, I'm a Christian. And it goes on through life that way. Bible study, assembling of the saints, practicing pure and undefiled religion, visit the widows and orphans in their afflictions, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world, and so on. Listen to what Jesus said concerning outward appearances. In Matthew 23, verses 14 through 28, I'll read most of it, but I'll skip down just a little bit as I get toward the bottom of it. Here he scathingly rebukes the Pharisees and the scribes, and he cries out, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for pretense make long prayer. You pay tithes that have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. For you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. For you are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Again, Matthew 23, 14 through 28. Now, you know what they were doing? They were doing what they do around holiday season. Have you ever looked at those pecans, especially in the shell? They've been polished. You ever notice that? They've been polished. Well, you can polish that pecan till it shines like a wax floor. Crack it open and see what you get if the meat's ruined. Pretty shell. That's not what you were after. Any more than I was after a pear when I wanted an apricot. I really wonder, I asked Jody, so I wonder whatever happened to that tree. I always call it my apricot tree. <laughs> Nothing is more vain, pointless, useless, worthless than putting on pretense while one's heart inner man is vile and impure. Remember, the Lord looketh on the heart. When people judge from outward appearances, often it elevates men to positions they don't deserve. It denotes men from places, I say demotes men from places to which they are justly entitled. Is that addressed in the scriptures? Yes. Is it addressed in the New Testament? Certainly is. James writing to Christians inspired of the Holy Spirit, penning one of the books of the New Testament of Jesus Christ, looked on such conditions. And here's what he said. My brethren. I don't know what he's talking about, but he says so. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect to persons. Was that a problem? They would uh, see the person who's a brother come in, or maybe not a brother, a visitor, dressed real nice for their day and time and culture. And they would give them the best seat. But then here's a poor person, not dressed very much at all or worth anything. And that person, because they show favoritism to the well-to-do person, it's the footstool position. And then James says this to my brethren in James 2, 1 through 4. Are ye then not partial in yourselves and become judges of evil thoughts? You're judging wrongly is what he's saying. You're judging according to appearance. I've seen that happen from time to time in different places. What has bothered me for a good long part of my preaching 
is that there have been a host of folks among the churches where I preach that were pretty much middle class, upper middle class folks. Here and there a few very rich people, but mostly middle class folks. But I never have seen a great many really poor folks. I will used to say poor Job's turkey. I don't know what that saying you mean anything to anybody anymore. Well, why is that the case? When Jesus said of the poor of his day, the poor have the gospel preached to them. So you start judging from outward appearances. And I can tell you who's going to win. The devil's going to win that contest. You want to see the epitome of that? Just look to Hollywood. Everything out there is glittering gold. If you want to see what it looks like to get to the greatest of things on the way of the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, all you have to do is go to the entertainment industry. That's what they thrive on. That's all they see. That's all they know. Remember that the devil always shows up in such company as that, Job 1.6. The outward appearance is quite deceiving. And why should we be surprised? Because Paul said in the New Testament to the church in Cor Corinth, in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 4, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel, a messenger of light. So the devil may be easily accepted if he just looks right as some people's evaluation and concept of what right is. And yet the poor people who are righteous don't even feel comfortable or welcome among those who have this world's good in abundance. Now Paul experienced this and it's an inequity. If appearances were the criteria, the Apostle Paul, in his great labors for the Lord, would have been sold a, a very short, or we would say it this way, he got the, the, the dirty end of the stick. 2 Corinthians 10.10, 10, Paul says of those who criticized his apostleship and actually denied he was an apostle, they said of him, his bodily presence is weak and his speech is contemptible. That's not a very flattering recommendation. And he checked such unreasonable and unfair type criticism when he says do you look on things after the outward appearance 2 Corinthians 10 7 what's going on here he's saying you're judging things for the wrong standard but he still said now that's really as far as my relationship to God and my work in the church a very small thing to me because in verses 3 and 4 of 1 Corinthians 4 he wrote it's a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment then he said but he that judgeth me is the Lord Paul knew that God would judge the polished shell but he would judge the purity of the inward man Now, the lesson's yours. And I will end with the one verse that our Lord gave to drive this point home. Let all I've said thus far simply be a commentary on that. And it's in the Beatitudes, the beautiful mindset, the beautiful attitude. In Matthew 5, 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. All I can say is don't spend a whole lot of time on polishing the shell. Spend a whole lot of time on what inhabits that shell. Are you a Christian today? 
Now's the time to become one. Some of you haven't become Christians for whatever reason. Only God knows in you. But you should put those things aside. If you are a Christian, are you polishing the shell more than tending to what makes the inward part good and wholesome and desirable and well-pleasing to God and to faithful brethren? We have those choices. What's amazing to me is that you can take all these things and reduce them down to quite clear-cut things where anybody that wants to can understand. Well, it would be a wonderful thing on this day when you honor fathers if those who need to obey the gospel would honor their heavenly father, embrace the son and obey the gospel, and make their earthly parents very happy. And we could all leave today one more added to the great army of God to go forth to look forward to the day when we don't have to be separated anymore. No matter how close you are right now, you will be separated in time as far as this earth's concerned and time here from those you love so much. But we are not those who have no hope. We have hope of being with all those who love God and live faithful that when this life is over we'll all be brought together in the land of fadeless day where there's no party. Now what a thought that is. Where's your courage, your love of God? Let it act to move you to obey the truth from a God who loves you and gave His Son to die for you. If you need to obey the gospel, we bid you come while we stand and sing.